Thank you so much, gentlemen, for, for joining us on this panel. I think we probably, before we get onto the conversation about the EU and uh, the UK, a possible exit from the EU, start from the elections. And so, Lord Mandelson, I'm going to turn to you as the only Brit on the panel. Which elections are there? The UK elections. Ah, the UK elections. <laughs> Impossible to predict, but what does it mean for the conversation that the UK will have the, with, with the EU? With the EU? Um, it means that if you have a Conservative-led government after the election uh, in May, and if they are able to get a majority in the House of Commons for the legislation, that we will have a referendum uh, on Britain's membership of the European Union. Uh, but there are two ifs. If we have a Conservative-led government and if they are able to get a majority in the House of Commons for the legislation. Incidentally, if you do have a Conservative-led government and they can't get the referendum, then almost certainly uh, the government will fall because there will be a huge revolt and backlash from amongst Conservative MPs, but that will be after Mr Cameron has been uh, uh, executed by his party. <laughs> to have a referendum, and if it were to happen, let's say, in 2016, because it will have to be brought forward from 2017 because of political uncertainty, yeah. uh, what are the chances of the UK actually voting not to stay within the EU? At the moment, I would say a 50% chance. Is that good or bad news? Is that better or worse than you expected? I don't know. But, I mean, it's, uh, it, I would say it's a 50-50 chance uh, that uh, the vote goes uh, the wrong way. Um, why? Uh, because um, who knows what forces you will unleash uh, within the Conservative uh, Party. I mean, if they are given half a chance, you know, you will unleash a great sort of momentum that, uh, uh, towards, the, uh, towards the exit. I mean, they're like sort of lemmings. I mean, they will just sort of race over the cliff like that and disappear into the abyss below if they have half a chance. On the other hand, uh, um, business leaders, I think eventually trade union leaders, um, civil society in general, uh, animal lovers, Bird watchers, uh, farmers, obviously, because you know there's a common agricultural policy to consider. Uh, they will be voting. They will be campaigning to to uh, to stay in. Labour in the main, Liberal Democrats. Uh, so there will be a counterforce. But if you ask me, what will be the final result? Uh, then I think after a campaign, as opposed to now, I would think uh, that there will be a vote to stay in by about 55-45, possibly 60-40, but more like 55-45, after the campaign, after the debate has taken place. And Professor Monti, I was going to ask you about the debate, because um, at the moment, if David Cameron were to stay in power with the majority, he's called for a referendum before the end of 2017. The timing... So these are also positions, but the timing of this is crucial because you don't want it too late, otherwise business is uncertain, you attract less investment in the UK, but it can't also happen too quick because then you don't start that dialogue where I guess Europe has to defend itself. What would be the ideal timing of a referendum? I think it would be ideal not to have a referendum. I am not uh, among those convinced that uh, a referendum is superior to parliamentary democracy when it comes to these matters. Um, by the way, the wise constitution of Italy does allow for referenda, except uh, in two areas, fiscal issues and ratification of international treaties. Uh, but uh, I believe that uh, there is one, at least one positive to this uh, David Cameron idea of a referendum, that it is a neat and clear-cut question. 
because uh, you remember in 2005 when there were the referenda in France and the Netherlands on whether or not to adopt the European Constitution, it was totally implausible that people should understand uh, anything about a text of 300 pages. This is at least a clear-cut question. And this, uh, not only in my view, increases the probability that people may understand what they are asked to pronounce about, but also it will trigger, I believe, a massive campaign, uh, even beyond the bird watchers, by those forces don't underestimate bird watchers. I know, I know. Can I, can I say, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds is the biggest, the biggest non-governmental organisation in Britain. And to a, to a portion of the non-committed public opinion, bird watchers may carry more weight in terms of the wisdom they convey than uh, EU watchers. So, <laughs> so there is also an indirect uh, impact. But, but, but at any rate... I find that observation a little shocking. A little? Okay. <laughs> um, but I will reflect further about this fundamental point. It's, it's a bit like this. Yes. Uh, so, so I believe in the end, in the end I cannot imagine that uh, the UK, uh, once the forces of the economy, of finance, etc., uh, come out and speak strongly, according to their interest, I cannot imagine a British government, a, 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 a UK public opinion saying no, particularly if, but this will come with your next questions, uh, if Europe uh, and the UK government uh, talking to each other do the right things between now and then. Just on the, on the question of the timing of the referendum, I mean, if we have to have this dialogue, is there an optimum time? Because uh, Professor Monti seems to, to be very optimistic that actually the UK would stay with, within the EU, but there's a lot of misconceptions at this moment about, for example, how many laws are drafted in Brussels, transplemented here instead of the other way around. Well, if the British government were to insist uh, on uh, such changes that required a treaty uh, uh, alteration, then those negotiations will not happen quickly, and they may not even happen at all at the end of the day. I mean, you know, if on the other hand, um, without a change of treaty, uh, it becomes easier, obviously, for our partners in the Union uh, to make easier concessions uh, to us that everyone can live with, and that would be a shorter process. Uh, than trying to get some, negotiate some treaty revision. And uh, if I think of the concessions, they're pretty obvious. I mean, they're to do with um, uh, immigration and welfare entitlement. They're to do with um, subsidiarity. They're to do with the role of national parliaments. They're to do with, you know, are we really uh, by sort of statute governed by a desire to create an ever closer... Uh, union. This is the debate the British have with themselves the whole time. Nobody else does, uh, but the British do. Um, competitiveness, burden of regulation, issues like that. You know, these are not fundamental uh, to uh, the existence of the European Union. Secondly, they command quite a wide consensus uh, of support in favour of reform and change. Um, uh, and thirdly, in my view, uh, if you ticked off those, uh, then I think a British Prime Minister could come back and say, look, I've got all these changes, these reforms, they're very important, not just for us, but for Europe as a whole, and therefore I can recommend that we vote yes to stay in. That, I think, is possible. But if the pressure on, the British, on a Conservative Prime Minister was so great within his party that he felt unable to limit uh, the uh, negotiations to those sensible parameters, then we would have a problem. I mean, first of all, it would be his problem, uh, but then it would be a problem for the rest of us. Professor Monti, do, do, you, uh, do you think that the UK can successfully renegotiate, I guess, on these basic points without the Germans putting red lines on immigration, for example? 
While on immigration there may be, and that will be difficult, a change in principle about free movement of people, I don't believe very much in that, but there may be uh, some uh, uh, decisions to set up uh, uh, a fund to cope with some domestic consequences in certain areas where there is considerable EU, uh, intra-EU immigration. But above all, I follow Lord Mandelson's line, uh, although I would change the wording a bit, concessions. There is a lot of ground where the UK, in my view, would take a position of high moral ground, which does, I think, nobody remembers in our living memory a situation when the UK was in a position of high moral ground vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the rest of us on the continent, by asking not for concessions, but by uh, raising the flag of the single market, of openness, of competition, of competitiveness, uh, not presenting this as something that the continent owes and uh, unhappily grants to the UK, but as something that uh, it would have been always in the great common interest of each and every member of the EU to fight for. So, uh, and, and, uh, and this is something that the UK is very uh, legitimized to do because it was largely uh, Lord Caulfield uh, at the time of Margaret Thatcher action that brought uh, about the single market. So I would love to see a British Prime Minister come to Brussels or go to Brussels and do exactly the opposite of what David Cameron did in December 2011 when the Fiscal Compact Treaty was negotiate, negotiated because there he came uh, to ask for a carving out of the City of London from any future change in regulation. That was seen by everybody uh, as a uh, backward step in integration. But if he comes and say, let's be serious finally, uh, let's fight for the single market. Let's decide that over a 48, uh, uh, over a two-year two period, uh, we, uh, I mean, today there was a lot of discussion on the inadequacy of the digital single market, of, of, the, of the capital movement union, the capital market union, et cetera, et cetera. Let's work effectively on this. Let's establish a procedure whereby violations of the single market are treated more strongly, more quickly. Then the Nordic will immediately applaud. Germany, I believe, would also come by. France may be in difficulty, the only ones, but it will be politically very difficult for them to say that they do not come on board. Italy, I think, will be supportive. And so the UK, would do something that politically and from the point of view of the image of the Prime Minister would be very positive and it would be very concretely, I believe, I may be wrong, in the interest of the British economy because where the single market needs to be completed is basically in the services area, from the professions to the digital. And the British economy is comparatively very strong in services. So he can come back home and say, look, I was recognized a great leadership and we got all we needed for us to thrive more in this Europe, for which I recommend you to vote yes. <laughs> How likely is I, that? I want to make one point on immigration, one point on uh, single market. O on immigration, um, I wouldn't name the British companies. I wouldn't name the British CEOs who have said to me that they would find it really hard to operate and grow their businesses without free movement of labour. I don't want to embarrass those businesses, obviously. Um, but the truth is that uh, we need in Britain um, uh, 
more people, different skills, different, ex different expertise to fill key jobs in our economy and our businesses, frankly, than we can supply from our own ranks. And if we had a situation, therefore, where we were trying to stop this uh, free movement, then we would pay an economic price uh, for that. This is realized, by the way, quite across business and uh, many people. Where the problem is, uh, is the perception, in some cases the reality, but you know, honestly, more the perception, where uh, lower skilled people uh, are coming to this country not actually to enjoy the uh, benefits of our welfare system. This is a tiny fraction of people who come and take benefits uh, from our welfare system, despite what you might read in the British newspapers. But there is a feeling that lower skilled people are prepared to take you know, lower wages, to undercut uh, the incomes of, of, uh, uh, of industrial and other workers, construction workers, or, or, or whatever. And there I do think we need to be cognizant uh, of an issue which is of public concern and, and not just uh, in, uh, in Britain. Some legislation obviously exists already to guard against what you might call social dumping, uh, but I think uh, it may be necessary for us to look again and see uh, the, the, the way people can be uh, uh, protected. If uh, uh, a Conservative Prime Minister went in these negotiations to argue that there should be some compromise or infringement of the free movement of labour, therefore, there would be many people in Britain who would disagree with that in principle, but there would be many others who, from an entirely pragmatic point of view, would oppose it as well. Second point on single market. Mario makes very, very good points, and I completely share his uh, uh, analysis. The tension comes uh, between those who are you know, in the single market, but not in the Eurozone, where uh, there is a clear uh, need uh, for what you might call core Europe, those in the Eurozone, uh, to grow closer together, to integrate their policy making, their decision making, uh, uh, etc. Uh, and personally, we need this. We need banking union. We need uh, closer uh, fiscal uh, policy integration. We need greater uh, fiscal convergence and in other uh, uh, variables uh, as well. The problem arises where those who are outside the Eurozone feel that their, their rights, their prerogatives, as members of the European Union operating in the single market, not in the Eurozone, are being squeezed by more exclusive decision-making within the Eurozone. And therefore, we need to bridge uh, the interests of those who are in and out of the Eurozone. I'm absolutely sure it's possible to do that. We've already done it yes. perfectly successfully, uh, but where it needs to be uh, covered more, um, that would also be a matter uh, for uh, discussion. Can, can I ask a question of Peter? You and I seem basically, we cannot say it publicly, optimistic on the fact that British uh, uh, pragmatic wisdom in the end would prevail. I'm cautiously optimistic. Of course. And I'm slightly cautiously optimistic. <laughs> but, uh, but both of us would be happier if uh, there weren't to be a referendum. But now I am asking you the following question. Is it better to risk a bit because there is a referendum, but this story of uh, British Euroscepticism is uh, set aside once and for all because the referendum says yes to Europe? I mean, would a yes in the referendum, assuming that there is, um, give us a more mature UK public opinion and press for the future? Well, of course, what would really give us a more mature, sensible, stable, balanced approach to Europe is by not having the Conservative Party in power. Now, you might think that that's a cheap, a partisan uh, observation, 
But, you know, the fact is that when you have Labour governments, you don't have these problems. I mean, we had 13 years of Labour government under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. And, you know, European concern, uh, anti-Euroscepticism, was somewhere down here. You have to understand the extent to which, in Britain, this issue is fermented by a civil war taking place on the centre-right of the political spectrum, fuelled and fanned by the bulk of the newspapers um, who are active participants in this civil war. And it, uh, if, you, if you take combine that with the aftermath of a financial crisis and a sort of years of austerity, which make people both sort of more frightened and insecure, as well as more angry about, you know, Europe's governing elite, it, that becomes, uh, that adds uh, to the cocktail. And you have a jockeying for leadership of the Conservative Party, a desire to oust Mr Cameron, because he's thought to be not a proper conservative. You know, he's not, he's not a real, you know, he's not a real right winger. He's some sort of confection. He's some sort of... He's even polite. It, well, he's courteous and, you know, he's sort of nice to uh, animals and young children and, uh, and things. I mean, he's sort of normal. He's sort of not nasty, you see. So, um, you know, you have to factor this in. I mean, there's a sort of... Um, a sort of cons constant sort of struggle underlying the surface of the Conservative Party to replace one leader uh, for another. And when you have a Labour government, you sort of don't have this. Um, you have other problems and other tensions and pressures, of course, but you don't have that problem and that tension. Now, um, uh, my... Uh, your question is, well, why don't you lance the boil? Does that translate easily into Italian? Lance the boil? Um, but but this, this is not an Italian problem, so use an English expression. Uh, 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 diff diffuse the issue. Diffuse the issue by having a referendum. Uh, I have two things to say about that. First of all, uh, yes, if, if we had a referendum on those terms and we won it, yes, it would be uh, very salutary. Uh, it would be very helpful. But it's a, quite a risk. You're not dealing with, in our membership of the European Union, with some sort of optional extra, some sort of decoration, some ornament you know, that you can, that you like to have, but you could, you know, exist without. This is something of absolute fundamental national interest for Britain. It's fundamental not just to us in terms of our economics and our trade. It's fundamental to our security, and it's fundamental to our position in the world. If instead of being a great European nation, we were instead Little Britain. What would be the consequences? I mean, our voice would be smaller in the world. The respect for us by America uh, would be smaller uh, as a result. Uh, the time that we would be given by the Chinese leadership would be smaller uh, as a result. I mean, the our ability to withstand pressures uh, on our wider borders, for example, from Russia, would be less than we would otherwise be able to do when we combine with the rest of the European Union. So when people say, oh, why don't you have a referendum just to clear the air? Well, hmm, yes, on a good day, but on a bad day, it would be an absolute disaster for us, which would uh, fundamentally affect uh, our whole condition and outlook and, put, and success uh, as a country. Rather than a referendum to clear the air, you are saying that best would be to have an election, perhaps with a Labour win, and then the assurance that Conservatives will never come back in the future. <laughs> well, put it this way, if Labour did win the election, the convulsion, the tearing apart uh, within the Conservative Party would be so great that the consequences would probably last for at least a decade.
clear, a clear win. But Not a coalition. Had a clear win. A clear win. Uh, I mean, Cameron will be thrown out of the nearest window. Uh, I mean, really, I mean, this civil war, this sort of fissile condition of the Conservative Party. Look, I know about fissile conditions inside political parties. I lived through the Labour Party in the 1980s. You know, for a decade and more, you know, we, we were like this against each other. You know, the, the, the left versus the moderates, uh, the Trotskyists versus the mainstream, Tony Benn versus, you know, Neil Kinnock. And it went on and on. Uh, so I know all about civil wars inside political parties. Uh, I know one when I see one. Uh, and if the Conservatives lost the election, my God, uh, there would be uh, a bloodletting uh, of, of very great proportions. Uh, Professor Monta, is there something that the, it's, uh, sometimes it's difficult for the people um, sitting in Brussels or even Rome to understand the subtleties of the UK public and what you were saying about perception, about whether, you know, if it's on a bad day, they would vote no to a referendum. What can the EU do at this point to make sure that if there is a referendum, the UK public votes to stay in the EU? Is it concessions? Is it... it I, well, the EU has also to take into account, although it is perhaps a minor factor, that there are 27 other public opinions in Europe. Um, so rather than multiplying concessions, I think the... Uh, the best course would be for the European Union and for the authorities in Brussels to devise some things that would be acceptable or positively helpful to everybody else. I think, I think Prime Minister Cameron would call this option a Pareto optimality course. Wouldn't he? He may well do. Yes. Uh, and I'm some... not sure if it would be understood, <laughs> but he would probably. Yeah. But just before th being thrown out of the window, oh, that, that would be the last uh, yeah, yeah. exclamation. Are, are, we speaking off the, are we speaking off the record here? Are we speaking in public? I know I should have asked this question at the beginning. We're, we're on the record. Uh, we're on the, oh my God. Okay. Let's, uh, <laughs> I'll be a little bit more careful than I think in what I say from now on. Uh, so, uh, things that are positive for the rest of Europe, but things that uh, the body politics of many other European countries would not be too fond of, and which can then be presented to the UK as a triumph of the UK in Europe. But for this to be even reasoned by Brussels, I believe, uh, we first need to have uh, the, the British Prime Minister coming out a bit more about uh, uh, what uh, he would envisage. Yeah. He won't do that, of course, before the election, because anything he comes out with now will be condemned by his party as, as not uh, being adequate. Will he do that uh, rather quickly afterwards? I hope so. I hope so, should he win, which, of course, is unlikely. Um, <laughs> can I just make one qualification to what Mario said? I think he's absolutely right to stress that there are 27 other public opinions. And the idea of those public opinions forming a queue of people who want to, uh, you know, give one concession after another to Britain is not realistic. It's not going to happen. But we do have to understand that some of the argument behind the British case which has yet, of course, to be presented. I accept that. Not, not the anti-Europeanism that you have in the UK or in probably half the Conservative Party. I'm talking about those who want to stay in, um, a, 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 just to use shorthand, a reformed Europe. I think that that has an appeal uh, across the European Union. Why do I say that? because you just have to look at the ele results of the elections of the, for the European Parliament, not, of course, in Italy, uh, which was you know, a great success for uh, the PD and for that son of Mario Monti, uh, Matteo Renzi. Um, 
very proud, but I don't want to take uh, that merit uh, so explicitly. That. You, don't, you don't want to take that strict paternity. Don't, don't, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like my immediate predecessor to feel offended because of the very limited share of paternity that apparently you are uh, granting to him vis-a-vis -vis the current Prime Minister. I understand that there's a sort of slight rival paternity, but, for, but uh, uh, for those of us in the rest of Europe who admire you so much and are so relieved that Mr. Rinzi is still there, um, you can understand that I meant it as a compliment. Yes. Now, um, uh, in the rest of Europe, outside Italy, there was a very big message from the European parliamentary elections. First of all, the participation in those elections went down again from one election to the next. Secondly, uh, the message was, we are not happy. We're not happy about a lot of things, incidentally, but including we're not really happy about sort of Brussels, if I can use that uh, 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 term as well. And we have to take that into account. It, it, I mean, when I say we, I mean all of us in the European Union are not just uh, in Britain. You know, we have to understand that uh, whilst you know, the economics is pointing one way very clearly towards greater integration and convergence uh, in, in, in Europe, the politics is pointing in a slightly different uh, uh, direction. We have to understand that for many people in uh, Europe, people who feel um, at best bewildered by globalization, uh, and the forces that it has unleashed, and at worst, not just bewildered, really insecure uh, and under undermined. For many of those people, they feel that the European Union should be there to protect them and to shield them from the forces of globalization. And instead, they see, in many cases, a rather liberal economic uh, project whose role, it seems to be, is to intensify and to accelerate the forces of globalization and their impact uh, on Europe. And people are a bit sort of confused uh, 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 by that, uh, uh, to be honest. And I think that we have to understand, I, I, I am a, I'm a new Labour man, as you know. I'm a liberal economic man. Um, but we have to understand that whilst the uh, economic efficiency of Europe requires a commitment to sound liberal economics, there also has to be alongside economic efficiency, social equity as well in Europe. And that requires a different set of policies. It requires, in my view, a social democratic uh, set of policies. So you, you have to have liberal economics within a, a, a structure of social democratic policies, which are not, I'm afraid, policies that can be made simply in Brussels. Many of those policies, which are about social equity, which are about distribution, which are about a fairer balance between the losers uh, and the gainers from globalization are the responsibility of national governments within the member states. And I always found when I was trade commissioner, and perhaps uh, uh, Mario found this as well in his uh, uh, responsibilities, that I was sort of pulling the levers that made liberal economics work in trade and competition and whatever, but they weren't sufficiently complemented by member state governments pulling the levers of social democratic, democratic protection of individuals. I don't mean protection of economies, I'm not a protectionist, but I do believe uh, uh, in greater social equity and I do believe in greater protection of individuals. And I think we have the balance slightly out of uh, kilter in Europe. Can I ask you, we talk about a reformed Europe as sometimes an abstract thing, and you were pointing there to some reforms that you would personally put in place. And I want to ask you the same thing, Professor Monti. Is there anything, be it either red tape that you would cut down, the number of commissioners, bureaucracy, or more, more social policies to protect the, the, the people within a liberal economic environment? How would you reform, maybe you know, your two, three reforms that you think would help the UK case and have support from most European Union countries? 
reforms or advancements, uh, again, uh, more single market, I think, is needed and would please the UK. Um, quicker decision making with some institutional changes would be possible. But I think Lord Manderson pointed to, to a very fundamental point, uh, which uh, he calls more social democratic approach. And I, referring to the uh, Treaty of Lisbon, call with a terminology that is there, a highly competitive social market economy. I think this is our objective. And I completely agree with you, Peter, when you say uh, the, the liberal dimension has to be, and probably also in the future, will have to be pushed largely by Brussels, but uh, the uh, soft policies of social protection of the individual, not of the individual job, will need to be conducted uh, mostly by the member states. Uh, do you see that feasible without some more tax policy coordination than we have in place now? Because uh, you know, as well as I do, that in several countries in Europe, people say, we are seeing a growing anxiety of uh, the public opinion, of workers, uh, about the single market because they see the advancements of economic integration uh, as uh, um, impeding social protection. And the reason is that this increasing tax competition without a minimum of tax coordination, of course, reduces the revenue base on which individual member states, according to their policy options, can exercise some social policy. But if we are to propose a bit more of tax coordination, I think this would not go down well in the UK. So how to reconcile your wish about the shape of the market and the social in Europe with this fundamental, I believe, point about uh, tax policy? I think that's a very, very good question. On which we could reflect in and, the future. And you're, absolutely <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you're absolutely right. It's a very sensitive issue in Britain. I agree with you. <laughs> um, if, if you look at... Let me make one point, though, uh, on this. You know, as a... Uh, as a business minister as I was when I came back to the government when I had to leave Brussels, um, I became aware of this particularly, I think, invidious tax competition uh, uh, in, in giving inducements and incentives uh, for investment, uh, where there were certain member states um, facilitating a sort of uh, process of arbitrage being played by international companies uh, uh, between and against uh, different tax jurisdictions. I don't like that. I don't like that. And I uh, personally believe uh, that uh, we, we, do, we do need rules uh, in these areas uh, which uh, do not facilitate both that sort of unfair undercutting and that arbitrage, that playing off of different uh, member states and jurisdictions uh, against each other. I also believe uh, that uh, tax evasion and tax avoidance, one being legal and the other not being, uh, are a, a, a hugely undermine uh, the tax base in many parts of Europe. Uh, and that is as high a priority, if not a higher priority, uh, uh, to deal with than a uh, tax competition of the sort that uh, Mario has described, for two reasons. One, it's undermining our tax base uh, uh, and making it harder to fund uh, the necessary activities and services of the state. And secondly, it makes people furious, absolutely furious, that at a time when austerity is imposing such a 
uh, such pain and such a burden on people uh, that a tiny minority are able to use clever accountants to get out of paying almost any tax at all. But so between now and 2017, what should Mr. Juncker and his commission do? Should they accelerate action to, I mean, against this form of uh, devastating tax competition around companies, also because Mr. Juncker, as we all know, has the personal incentive of putting the Luxembourg leaks uh, to rest, or they should uh, stop any action uh, in the fear that uh, whatever they do uh, will uh, exasperate uh, even more uh, many in the Conservative Party and perhaps not only in that? Uh, um, if it's a choice between Mr Juncker and the British Conservative Party, I'd go for Mr Juncker. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's the most important thing, but I think it is an important thing, uh, and I think there will be wide consensus uh, across the EU uh, for action to be taken uh, on these matters. And by the way, I think actually when the argument is put, that consensus would embrace Britain as well. I have one final question, and then we're running out of time, so I'll throw questions to the floor. How does the way the EU will either exacerbate the mess with Greece or deal with it, actually have an impact on UK public perception on what the EU is? Um, I, I think people in Britain uh, are incredibly worried about Greece. I think uh, uh, I, 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 all week I go to conversations or join discussions where people are speculating what will happen and what would the consequences would be. Uh, for the Eurozone uh, if Greece were to leave uh, and what the impact that would be on the rest of Europe, including uh, Britain. Uh, my own view is that, frankly, at a time when things are picking up in the Eurozone, to take a risk with that recovery, that nascent uh, recovery, by uh, uh, refusing uh, uh, some flexibility over what is a tiny fraction of our overall um, uh, 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 spending and borrowing uh, in Europe uh, would not be wise. I do think that if you were to uh, uh, show uh, 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 some flexibility, there would have to be uh, a, a very real condition attached to it. And that is that the flex sort of flexibility that I would like shown uh, to the Greek government, uh, reflecting the democratic basis and mandate that that government was elected with, uh, would be additional spending in Greece to alleviate social distress in Greece. Uh, that's the sort of flexibility I would like to see. But the condition would be that the other sort of flexibility to do with not continuing with the uh, privatization, for example, of state assets or continuing labor market reforms um, or, or whatever, and related uh, changes like that, that's not the sort of flexibility I believe that Europe uh, can afford. But the other sort of flexibility uh, to help address what are clear social needs in Greece. There, I think we can and should show some flexibility. Uh, yes, with this uh, caveat, yes. I believe, politically, it will have to be a sort of flexibility that uh, will not divide uh, Southern Europe because so far there is the division psychologically and so on between North and South in Europe. Suppose that Greece, with all the provocative attitudes, uh, uh, picturesque but really um, disgraceful that the current government is exhibiting, uh, gets uh, uh, out, I mean, gets out, stays in the euro, but uh, in the end uh, at much more favorable conditions than the pain that the Spaniards, the Portuguese and others have had to endure, then 
Greece will not be loved by the fellow southerners in Europe, and this is already visible, a crack within the south. Uh, so I believe the flexibility uh, should not so much consist in uh, lightening the uh, contents of what uh, Greece committed to do, but uh, uh, should consist in granting more time, and I like very much the idea of Lord uh, Mandelson, something additional to cope with some of the uh, tensions. Um, the, uh, the last thing I would like uh, uh, to say uh, is that uh, the uh, as to the contents, uh, I, I would uh, see and understand some changes. Here perhaps we differ, but uh, if they do a bit less privatization and a bit less liberalization, after all, this is the minimum one can expect from a neo or paleo Marxist uh, government. Uh, but if that uh, if they were to give a, a more left-leaning orientation to their structural reforms with a very serious fight against tax evasion and against uh, corruption, which would be more in line with their policy platform, I would welcome that very much. And I know, I know of other European countries, uh, southern European countries, where I believe a serious fight against tax evasion and against corruption is by no means less important than a flexible labour market. Agreed. Can I take questions from the floor, please? Yes, I think there's one there on the left. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm from PwC. Recently, I moved to London from Milan. As a Chinese, I have a question. Like, China proposed to set up the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank recently. Well, Europe defy US to join the Chinese led bank. So I'd like to know from your view why Europe defy US on this matter and how would this kind of like have any impact on the in the future for that relationship to with US and relation with China. Like, yeah, thank you. This is actually a case where Britain was giving a lead and Europe followed. I mean, to be honest, the uh, broad European view uh, was to defer to the Americans. Uh, the British decided not to. And then you saw other national capitals adjusting their position uh, uh, following that. And I think that's right. It's not uh, designed to defy the United States. It's not designed to weaken or undermine existing international financial uh, institutions. Um, it's not designed to be some sort of you know, seminal rejection of, uh, uh, of Bretton Woods. Uh, and I, I think that the American reaction um, is an exaggerated one. I understand uh, uh, what its motivation is, but I think it's uh, exaggerated, and I do think uh, that the uh, uh, Asian um, uh, uh, bank, uh, investment, uh, infrastructure in, in investment bank, uh, can coexist with the World Bank. I don't think that, you know, the world is such a small place uh, that there's only room uh, uh, for one. But it does go to something a little bit more sort of basic, and that is a view of China in relation or well, the emergence of China and what it means for the international system. There is a view in Washington, as I very well know, uh, that you know, China has to change before it's given full admission or rights uh, within the international system. Uh, the Chinese view is, let us come into the international system. Uh, it will help and encourage us to make the changes that you want, and in the process, uh, we can join with others in helping to sort of reshape or uh, recalibrate uh, the way the structure and the rules governing those international institutions. If you ask me which side I come down on in that argument, I have to say I come down, um, you know, with my fingers crossed and uh, slightly gritted teeth um, <laughs> on the China side. 
because I don't think it's realistic or reasonable for the West to keep on saying, you have to make all the changes that we want you to make uh, before we allow you to come and play a full, equal part in our international institutions. I know that's not literally what we're saying, but there's a tone uh, of that in our um, communications uh, to, uh, uh, to the Chinese. And, and I just don't think it's right. You know, the, these institutions were created uh, after the last uh, war uh, where Western prerogatives, Western priorities, Western capital uh, held complete sway uh, over the international uh, system. Uh, and that uh, is, has changed. We're living in a very different world. And therefore, I think we have uh, to, uh, to both to reform and modify our existing institutions and create room for new ones that reflect that rebalancing that has taken place in the world. And I'd rather that is the subject of mature discussion and agreement uh, rather than uh, uh, an attempt to, you know, to divide the international community. You have to come down on the American side or you're against America. That's not what I would like to see uh, as the way forward uh, within the international system. I have one more question and then we're running out of time. Yes, the gentleman there. I'm not sure we can hear you. Can we we'll maybe just have a microphone? Very briefly, the story you just spun about China, isn't that what Greece said to the European Union? You know, we'll reform once we're in. Not quite, no. N not, not quite. I mean, you know, look, I can, if you want to have a discussion about China's preparedness to change, I will have a discussion with you about, for example, the terms of China's entry to the WTO. You can argue uh, that that glass is well half full, that China really did fulfill and implement uh, the tariff changes and reprofiling uh, that it was required to do as a condition for its entry uh, to the WTO, uh, and, and that therefore we should tick that box as a success. Equally, you could say, well, actually, there's an awful lot more that China was expected to do once it was in the WTO, uh, which, ha which it has been less eager to undertake, and that's a disappointment and reflects the fact that the glass is half empty. We can have that discussion, uh, but frankly, I would, uh, 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 with the benefit of hindsight, still prefer China to have been brought into the WTO with the changes uh, that it made in the hope and expectation uh, that it will continue to make changes and continue to help shape uh, and, uh, and, and underpin a rules-based inter uh, international trading system in the way that we want, expect it to do, and which, frankly, yes, it should be doing so with greater speed and enthusiasm than it's doing at the moment. One very last question for me on, on the, a, an EU army. Does that make a difference to the British public? Again, we talk about perception. Is it a, um, a, a blunder to be talking about something like this, which doesn't have the backing of the EU public at, at, at such a sensitive time? Are we sure it doesn't have the backing of the, of the, no. Euro, of the European no, public? Not necessarily, no. I admit that uh, the historical coincidence through which it is uh, a former Prime Minister of Luxembourg to propose a European army is, uh, is a bit curious, yeah. but uh, uh, what would be the reaction of the... It depends how it's put. If you said to people in Britain, would it be better if we uh, coordinate, coordinated better uh, the European production of arms equipment and better coordinated the procurement of, uh, or, or, or so as to get better value for money. And by the way, would it also be a good idea uh, if we took, uh, we drew on different European armies uh, in order to uh, uh, deploy uh, battalions where they're needed, uh, perhaps under uh, a commander who is not from your own nationality, I think uh, after a short discussion, the majority of British people 
would agree with that, that that was desirable. If, on the other hand, you said, do you believe that we should create a European army, full stop, as if it's an army that's replacing your own national army, or is an army that is placed under the control of uh, President Juncker uh, in the European Commission, and that, I, uh, and that could be deployed against the UK in case of a certain outcome of the referendum. <laughs> I think you would have a negative reaction uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the British public. So it really depends on what you're proposing. You know, so don't, you, best not to use shorthand, I think, in these circumstances. A European army, I don't think, is sellable. Um, Europe better European coordination, planning, procuring of defence equipment and having more of it made to bolster the industrial base of Europe, yes. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you very much.